all right, what are we passionate about? What, what can we get behind? What can we get excited about? What, what can disrupt people in their newsfeed? One of the big things that we always talk about is how can we stop the scroll? You know, you, there's only so much digital real estate on a phone as you're scrolling. You've got a couple of milliseconds to really make them stop. So you have to have powerful branding, imaging, copy to really grab their attention. And as long as we're spending a shit ton of money on Facebook, Instagram, you know, having all of the back end kind of robust flows set up, people are going to buy. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Robust Marketer. I feel like we're in the middle of the 12 days of Christmas. So I think we've got two turtle doves here with us today. Uh, we've got Corey and Keegan Rush from Blue Pack Marketing. These guys have built an eight figure e-commerce juggernaut uh, on branded apparel. They're sort of the kingpins of branded apparel. Uh, and there's a couple couple real wild cards, I think. So I'm super excited to have them involved. They've gone above and beyond the call when it comes to spreading the world word about Las Vegas, January 9th and 10th e-commerce and Facebook Mastery Live. They, they went out and they, they did some filmmaking for us. They've, uh, they, they've been, it's just a lot of a pleasure to be working with them. So welcome to the Robust Marketer today. How are the Rush Brothers doing? Awesome. We're doing great. Thank you for having us on. We're definitely excited to chat a little bit about what we do today. Uh, we're definitely looking forward to Las Vegas. You don't have to invite us twice to get us out there. So looking forward to having some fun and shooting shit on stage about what we do and how we can help everybody scale it up. We're decking no, no. the halls. Did you get that? Right. Dicking, yeah, you dicking the halls? You were decking the halls. I don't know what the dicking part. I don't know. What I gotta keep. I, I have to do the dick jokes. Like it's it's legally mandated. So let it, this is gonna say Keegan. Right? Right. Keegan in the Keegan in the blue. Corey in the green. Correct. Yes. Nice. Who's older? That would be I. I feel like you can tell though. Like you should be able to tell. I, I would at least assume from that side of the camera. It's it's uh, who's tougher? That me. Definitely. I think we should take this to a Facebook poll. Maybe Would you watch a horror movie right now in front of the audience? He's pulling out. He's pulling out. Went too far there. But it. Fist if we brought fist it out, you lose your shit. I think I'm, I'm taking him. But as far as like watching scary movies, there's just certain things that I just I'm not comfortable doing. Okay. Well, good to know. So why don't we back up a little bit? And give us your hero's journey as a as a as a pair. How did you how did you guys come to to dominate branded apparel and e-commerce game? So it probably started about 34 years ago. Our parents had met and decided to do things, and that's where Corey came to be. And no, I think he means like like just like business thing. Yep. I'm getting there. I'm I'm trying to be grandeur about it. Um, right. a couple of years later I was born. Um, Probably 23, 24 years later, I discovered a site called Teespring. And a lot of people in kind of our, our industry got their starts around Teespring. And leading up to that, I was 24 years old. I was working a shitty retail job. You know, I had some side hustles. I had a sports blog that pulled in money on Google AdSense. It paid the rent, paid another bill or two. For a 24 year old kid without a degree, you know, I felt like I was getting through life. You know, I wasn't hurting for money, but I wasn't, you know, blowing it by any means. And eventually kind of my goal in life was to honestly fuck around until I had to beg my big brother for a job. And, you know, I don't have a degree. I, I would probably say that, you know, I would probably say that being in 2018, you know, even 2014 leading up, it was right place, right time. You know, we've always had a hustler mentality, you know, doing side hustles and this and that. But, you know, Corey actually had a six figure job that he left to really start scaling our company up. And it started in 2014. My first Teespring campaign took off and it sold about 90 units. So from my first campaign, I had just made my monthly paycheck pretty much. Uh, Next campaign sold about 495 and it just really started snowballing from that point. 
And, you know, he makes the joke all the time that he thought I was selling drugs. It wasn't a joke. Like, it was... No, that that's where pretty, I was... Pretty serious. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, as a 24-year-old kid, I have no idea what I'm doing. There's tumultuous amounts of money. I don't know where to put it. IRS, taxes, all this stuff. So Corey came on to help me run the books and over time, you know, developed into a full-fledged partnership. Um, you know, he can jump in and kind of tell you where he came from and kind of how that got going. Yeah, I think it was it was interesting. So Keegan and I had a few different entrepreneurial ventures prior to Teespring, prior to any of this, kind of on that side hustle, that hustler's mentality that Keegan kind of talked about. Uh, we had a flag football league, an adult flag football league. Some of these dudes were like former NFL athletes, D1 athletes. It wasn't what you think when we say adult amateur athletics. It was one of the biggest on the planet. And we saw that scale and we saw how we work together and we're like, well, we can kind of deal with each other. This works like it's better than dealing with other idiots. So at least when we argue, we can get over it and, and move on. And we had another uh, entrepreneurial venture. Uh, we decided to make toilet decals. Um, but then we ran into a block when we realized that licensing would probably be tough to go to, say, the University of Texas to ask for licensing for a toilet sticker. So that didn't work out. So this thing kind of took off and I said, you know, well, if we took kind of basic business practices, if we look to hire and, and kind of scale systems, this could probably go from a six figure business to potentially a seven, eight, and you know, over the past four or five years, a, a nine and 10 figure business. And it, it really just came down to, do we want to do this? And do you feel comfortable enough that what you've learned so far, like this is, this has got staying power and, you know, it's weird. And I guess that's the brother mentality. He was like, yeah, dude, I think it does. And this is, you know, me in a Fortune 500 company as a director going, hey, honey, I'm, I'm me and my brother are going to do this T-shirt thing. Uh, so I'm quitting. So that didn't go over very well um, with the wife, but I did it anyway. And, you know, it, it literally turned into we started in a basement with two laptops, no designers, no nothing no brand outside of the like the brand of doing what we were doing and just saying throw the deep ball like that's kind of one thing like you'll hear not only in vegas but people in our building here all the time like we are brett far we have that brett far mentality you know sometimes you're going to turn the ball over but sometimes you're going to score 60 a game and we both share that you know we we're going to we're going to take big chunks and we're going to go for those big plays and it, it allowed us to really disrupt what people were doing. There was a lot of people selling on Teespring or Sunfrog or any of those platform-based uh, selling concepts. And we kind of went in and go, well, let's just do it from every angle. Let's go from this niche or that niche, and we're going to sell tees, long sleeves, hoodies. We're going to change up how we speak to customers. And along the way, we started thinking, well, what if we disrupted this? Um, kind of based on that that theory of art. Well, if we do Teespring differently, what if we do Shopify differently? And instead of going for whether it be drop shipping or you know free plus shipping, all the all the things that have progressed through the e-com world, what if we made our thing like actually being a good person, actually having a good product, and actually doing what we say that we're going to do, which is deliver a product that not only is quality but in a timely manner? So we had this like theory of brand. You know, this is something that we would want, but we didn't have a brand. We didn't have a brand. It, it takes time. And fast forward four years, we've, we've sold a brand um, off of the Shopify platform that was a, a lucrative offer. And currently we're developing our brand and working with partner brands as well to really take them to the next level from a branding perspective. So outside of like a bunch of weird Las Vegas strip club stories, some Atlanta stories, a few times in New York. That's pretty much it. Very cool. Uh, now, when you say, uh, with, like, with a brand that you're most focusing on building right now, is it the Blue Pack marketing brand where you're sort of disrupting the e commerce marketing game, or is it specifically a direct to consumer e commerce brand as well? It's hard to really, like, it'd be hard for me to put that in a nutshell. I, I, I think I can help. A good combination of both. So, Corey had mentioned that we have successfully sold a Shopify brand before, and it was a very good deal. And through that, we built up a supply chain, we built up sourcing, we built up all these great things that when you bottle it up, it was actually you know, a really good asset. And we knew that if we were to offload that asset, somebody else could take it and run with it a lot longer. And it, it wasn't an area that we were very passionate about. 
So when we were able to sell that brand, we started thinking about, all right, what are we passionate about? What, what can we get behind? What can we get excited about? What, what can disrupt people in their newsfeed? One of the big things that we always talk about is how can we stop the scroll? You know, you, there's only so much digital real estate on a phone as you're scrolling. You've got a couple more seconds to really make them stop. So you have to have powerful branding, imaging, copy to really grab their attention. So we built up this B2C, this B2C brand, but through that, we had a lot of wholesale offers and boutiques and stores coming to us saying, we want to carry your item in our store. What are your terms? You know, how can we do this? And we really had no idea. So over time, we picked up about 250 accounts that that store wound up getting into, you know, small kind of local chains, franchises, nothing big box, because, you know, we really weren't experienced to that realm. But we knew that with all of these accounts, that's a lot of production. Somebody's going to want this thing. And, you know, since then, the people we sold it to, they've been very successful with it. So since then, you know, obviously having a non-compete, we had to go into a kind of a different arena. And that's where we've really been kind of putting our focus, knowing that if we're growing the B2C channel, well, the wholesale B2B business is very viable as well. And as long as we're spending a shit ton of money on Facebook, Instagram, you know, having all of the back end kind of robust flows set up, people are going to buy. You know, we're going to be able to spend more up front because we know we're going to make the money on the back end. And if we're able to spend more for a consumer, we're ultimately going to win. So what we've done is just brought in thousands and thousands and thousands of customers. And we know that, you know, the wholesale channel, when people see that in stores, they always, always go to the website. Well, it just adds like we, we use the term like social currency, just like in our everyday language here at Blue Pack. But really, that's that that extra bit of validation when you see something. I hear the term. I saw something off Facebook or I bought something off Facebook so many times with my wife's friends or just people around the office. And it's interesting to me because they don't say I bought this with iStack or I bought this with X, Y, or Z. It, it seems that, that they relate to purchasing with Facebook. So how can you take that branding really to another level and get into these people's lives? And for us, it was finding a way to use Facebook methods, Instagram methods to grow our B2B channel and create B2B funnels the same way we did with B2C. And really that's for our brands, our partner brands and with Blue Pack. If you can sell a hat, you can sell a house. Like I've said that for a while now, we've actually seen that. Um, and Keegan uses the term digital real estate, but now like whether it's selling physical products or selling real estate concepts, it's the same theory, but there's different CPAs, there's different styles. And at the end of the day, there's different funnels and different omni-channel like attacks that you can use. Now talk a little, so you, you say, uh, you talked a little bit about about creative, and, and I'm really interested in creative. I think that, you know the more that media buying is automated, the smarter that Facebook gets about how to sequence ads and all of these things. I think there's going to be so much emphasis on creative capital and that ability to actually stop the thumb, as you say. So, would you say that that creative process is is a really is like a, a, a critical component to your business? And the follow up question to that would be: How do you take your sort of like weird Rush Brothers creativity? Uh, and, and and be able to infuse that throughout an entire organization so that all the media buying team is is thinking about ads in this sort of creative way. I, I definitely think that, you know, Facebook is going towards branding. You know, you see a lot of awesome brands and, and you know, Dan and Josh is live over the past two days. You know, kudos to those guys. You know, they're doing it how you should be. And if you have good creative, you have good copy, you're going to create a loyal following. And the biggest thing is you have to disrupt the newsfeed. You know, a lot of people use Getty images or they use place it or they use just these shitty CGI renderings. Well, if you're going to create a brand, not only are you investing in yourself, you're investing in a long term sustainable asset. Pay for a damn photo shoot. So if you build up all of these visual assets, video assets, hire a videographer, don't just use Upwork or Fiverr you know, truly invest. And if you're able to create good content, you know, it, it's almost like steroids for ad sets, because if you're just using a white background image, you know, it's boring. So a lot of the imaging that we do, 
you know, across our own brands, partner brands, all of that good stuff, it has to look real. So it can't look like, you know, a place it image where you can very clearly tell it's just a CGI rendering. It has to look real. It has to look genuine. What our goal is anytime we're selling anything, it has to look like one of your friends posted it because that's how you're going to get them to stop the scroll. And that's our number one goal. I didn't mean to make that rhyme. He's also here. He wanted to be an R&B star or a wrestler when he was a kid. So well, and you mix those together. You've got a great Coco Beware's kind of stuff, like <laughs> white version. That's I think I think you got something there. Yeah, and honestly, I'm only 29 years old, so I've still got plenty of time in life to make both of those things happen. Vince McMahon didn't become a wrestler until what? Until he's like 65 or something like that, and then he got jacked on steroids. So yeah. Crazy story, Vince McMahon owns one of the synonymous steakhouses in Raleigh, North Carolina. Yeah, we're gonna go down a rabbit hole here with uh, <laughs> these wrestling references. Uh, you're gonna get a phone call. Oh, oh we'll, we'll do a figure four leg lock in Vegas for sure. Uh, so I wanted to ask, the question I've been asking all, during these 12 days of Christmas interviews, I've been asking everyone, is uh, you know what they sort of really took from uh, Q4 this year? What, what, are, what are some of the key lessons that you put into place this Q4 that has made it a bigger success than previous ones. I don't know if this leads into, into omni-channel like you were discussing, but what would you say is your key takeaway from this Q4 for your business? I think I think that's where it really hits on, like Keegan was talking about, Josh and Dan and, and the other speakers in Vegas that are creating these brands and creating these companies that are truly companies. They aren't, you know, let's get like It's not quick. fly by night, drop shippers, which some sure people have heard. with it, you know, hats off to them. That's just not our thing. Yeah, I think really it was, if I could take one thing away from this year's Q4, it would be step back 30 days next year. Um, we're already starting planning for fiscal 2019, like next Q4, and we're doing that now. Because we saw that this year we took a really big planning direction uh, come September. Uh, you know, we've got a team of about 22 people here at Blue Pack Marketing having those war room sessions, but not having those war room sessions on how many ad images or conversion-based ads, or are we using Snapchat, or are we doing email, but setting those meetings up to go, hey guys, can we actually fulfill these products? What is, if, if you're holding inventory, what is that inventory? Or what if you hit a customs issue? What are we doing in case of these emergency situations? Try not to be reactive, but being proactive. So if I could take one thing away, it would be, Number one, celebrate your successes with your team. I, I've, I've really tried to make sure at, at Blue Pack here, we're celebrating that every day. We're telling our teams, you know, hey guys, we, we are kicking ass, but we've got these opportunities. How do we get better? And then actually being receptive and listening because some, sometimes the answers you're going to hear are going to require an investment, an investment in time, an investment in capital. But like we talked about earlier, and we'll always talk about if you're not willing to invest that time, energy, and money, you are not a brand, you are merely a commodity. And we all know with commodities, commodities will get cycled in and out of the economy. A brand has staying power. That's a, there's a reason why you buy Nike. They didn't cookie you. And you know, you hear these, these guys talk about that, like you buy it because of the brand and what it represents to you. So our goal is to, to plan better in fiscal 19 so that we can maybe get a day further next year or two days further, um, kind of with the plan, but, it's been a kick-ass fourth quarter around here. It's been fun. Uh, we've built this supply chain and this organization up. Uh, we went further than last year on a, a year that really kicked last year's ass. Now it's 2019. We have to do it again, and we want to do it bigger and better. And I would say my biggest takeaway from Q4 this year was, you know, really learning a deeper, a kind of a deeper dive on supply chain logistics. So understanding that. You know, if an order is able to be shipped, you know, washed like in Washington, customer orders it in Washington, we need to have some sort of vendor at the, either in Washington or in Oregon or close to one, capitalize on shipping profit, two, to actually capitalize on ship time. Because we're in the day and age of Amazon. If your item is taken two weeks with Chinese packaging, best of luck to you. We're going to smoke you out of the water. However, if you actually provide a good product and it ships in a timely manner, your people are gonna love you and they're going to rally behind you and you'll create just this rabid community of people that are willing to share your posts, share your memes, share your items and products and emails with their friends. And that's just the best social currency possible. So from our perspective, supply chain logistics, 
we had to ask ourselves, what if we actually hit our goal? What does that mean? So a lot of people in our space and, you know, Facebook groups and masterminds, it's only about sales. Well, somebody is on the other end of that stick where, yeah, you might have sales, but are you actually able to fulfill them in a timely manner where people are going to be happy about the experience? And if you can't genuinely say yes to that, then you need to take a step back and, you know, improve your shit. And I think that's what we did and what we want to make 2019 a big focus is bolstering supply chain. If we're wanting to double our goal from this year, that means we're going to have to double our output, double, you know, personnel, double vendors, everything, you know, is attached to doubling that goal because we're never, we're never going to be content. And we know if we're never going to be content throughout the year, we need to be cycling in new vendors so everything can ship in a faster manner. Well, one thing also is that another fourth quarter kind of a nugget. And I know in Vegas, we're going to talk a little bit more about the almost the war room tactics. But one of the things is really attacking that seven day window. Typically, you'll see people, you know, last day cut off December 12th, December 13th. I want to get better next year that we can ship up until December 22nd, you know, in certain areas and really capitalizing on regional shipping, priority shipping, running ads seven days longer than anyone else. Well, what that means is we're going to get better conversion. Conversion rate will go up just because of buyers. Oh, oh shit, it's time. But secondly, the CPMs are going to be so low because everyone else is out of the stream. Right now is an absolute just shooting fish with a nuclear bomb attached to your back in the world. And, and there's a lot of marketers that simply, if they're not these big brand companies, they can't play. I want to get to the point where we're playing with Home Depot, we're playing with Walmart and these mass retailers because they're able to execute on that. So that would be another kind of a, a goal for 2019 is to do all the things we've said so that we can run good, solid, consistent, profitable advertising in that seven days where 99% of the marketers on the planet cannot. Very cool. What's your media buying team look like? How many people are on your media buying team? Like shirts untucked, like unshaven. There's a couple of really nice girls um, who present themselves well, but for the most part, a bunch of scraggly looking dudes and a handful of really fantastic young ladies in the office. And then us, like we're, we're in there. That's on what the we're ask. Yeah, yeah we're, you guys are hands on ads on a daily basis. On a, on a daily basis. So we're, you know, I, I was listening to Dan's live yesterday and I have the same exact mentality. You know, Facebook is going to change so often. And, you know, we've been approached about courses and this and that. And it just, things change and they shift so fast. By the time that someone truly becomes, you know, an expert, well, it's going to completely be flipped on its head. And if they're not the business owner, they're not going to pour their heart into it as much as one of us would. Now we do have levels of automation and applications we use where you know we're not in there making page posts. We have processes and protocols set up where you know we're heavily involved in the oversight, management, and scaling. So almost having them volleyed up to us so we can provide that level of oversight and management. Our team is probably you know on the specific media buying realm, probably six to seven deep plus us. Cool. And do you still you still take that pride when one of your ads, when one of your copy or when one of your new strategies takes the cake, right? Absolutely. And we have weekly marketing meetings, which there's a lot of people and you know, to each their own. They can do this from home. They don't have to have an office. You know, we have twelve thousand feet or twelve thousand square feet out here in Clayton, North Carolina. We don't have to have that. But we do. We, well, we, kept play, we end up like playing FIFA and taking naps and shit when we work from home. So we realized that our personalities, like it was like bro commerce. And we realized that if we wanted to hit our goals, like we probably should actually like get disciplined and, and do this. And it's been really exciting. Yeah. To it, if we tried to scale our business via bro commerce, there would have been <laughs> no, no commerce. So. We knew that we had to formalize things, build a team, build a brand. And, you know, it, it's awesome having domestic employees. We have overseas employees as well. And just cum cumulatively, we have an awesome team that really bolsters a, us up and we have a great foundation. So it really allows us to scale and take time to focus on logistics. Because if you try to do everything, you're really not going to be able to do much of anything. Well, I think in, in 
in 2019, if you're not willing to be a businessman or businesswoman, this isn't the space for you because you're going to have to be able to adapt with this ever changing market and this ever changing organism that's Facebook and Instagram and Google. And, and Eric, you, you asked earlier, what is, you know, how do you pass on that psyche to the rest of the team? How do they have that silly rush brother mentality? But at the end of the day, we're going to get our shit done and we're going to try to beat everybody that we physically can because you know, we have these meetings, we have these face to faces where we actually listen to what they're saying. And, you know, a lot of good ideas, they don't have to come from my head. If I can help execute upon them, you know, our team, you know, that's the whole point of having a team. Because if you're not going to have a team, what's the point? Yeah, like ideation on, ideation on everything, like ideation on logistics, ideation on creative, ideation on copy, like, and actually listen to your people. Because like Keegan said, like a good idea can be spawned off the dumbest shit ever said. And Corey says a lot of dumb shit. And that's where I come in and we have a great idea. I literally take it and you said that. It's nice. all about empowering your employees, right? Giving your employees that ability to be brilliant and the space to innovate and, and, and then holding them accountable for it as well. Well, I think that the, one of the most exciting things is like learn from your mistakes. Like, because did we always do that? No, we didn't. And, but, and something that's great that it's almost you said a little something, Corey said a little something. So something specifically that we're going to be going over in Vegas, you know, we're definitely going to be talking about, you know, the psychology of consumers, the power of branding, but how that also ties into our nuke method. So we have, you know, our own favorite little Facebook, Facebook, you know, tactic, so to say. Love it. And, oh, people love it, tactics. It, it was crafted over a four day weekend where we really started look, looking deep into KPIs and seeing looking at a, you know, a, a set of ads, what are the, key, the KPIs on them? Well, how can we scale this, scale it fast, absolutely leave scorched earth on everything? And you know, I'm probably saying a little too much because I can talk about it later on, but we're very excited about talking about you know, the KPIs and, and automation that we're utilizing to be able to you know, scale up a big brand, to be able to you know, take on several big partner brands because you know, at the end of the day, if we are going to be so heavily involved in the Facebook management, you know, if you don't have automation and a team and things like that set up, you're not going to be able to effectively, you know, really perform at a high, at a high rate. It's called the nuke method. I got. I, I I've heard the tickle method now. I've heard. So it's the nuke method. Is that correct? I like it. Did you hear, did you hear the tickle method from him? Because that definitely sounds like something he would. <laughs> <laughs> that's his finishing move, I hear. Oh, I uh, but, uh, <laughs> sweet, I use sweet chin music. That one's mine. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, super, super interesting. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Vegas. So one of the things that people say, uh, and this is something I'm just interested in exploring because it's like it's my whole my whole business is getting these amazing entrepreneurs to feel amazing, which they do anyway. About sharing all this stuff with the audience. So talk a little bit about this like community we find ourselves in of people. And like, why is it that entrepreneurs like you guys who have these methods that are working super well are just super interested in sharing this stuff? Because I know, like you say, you like we don't really work with gurus. We don't really work with people who are making a lot of money on courses necessarily. We, we want to work with the business owners that are using these tactics. So why are guys like you so eager and able to share this wealth of knowledge? There, There is a very abundant amount for everyone. You know, there is a giant pie and no matter what processes and protocols we put into place, there's always a random subset of some industry that someone is crushing and you have absolutely no idea about them, what they do, what software they're using. Uh, a lot of applications in the real real estate world, you know, we've, we've worked with some local clients and seeing how they're crushing it on the local level well, what are they doing or what are they using that we can apply to what we do? So there are a lot of different brands, agencies, owners, employees, media buyers. Everyone has their own thing, I feel like, and people want to talk about what they do. You know, for us, it isn't so much, oh, they're going to rip us off. It's what can I learn from them? What can they learn from me? And I feel like a level of collaboration on being an entrepreneur, being a business owner, it's not to say it's lonely at the top, but you know, there are struggles that people face. You know, you see the great big screenshots, but you don't see 
the iceberg underneath of all the struggle and what it took to get there and being able to share a lot of those uh uh what's, what's war stories yeah. really is is what it is and i think one thing that you'll never get from us is we're always a, a fairly an open book um because somewhere along the line someone gave us that advice or someone gave us that theory to put into practice with our own business and, and i have no idea if this guy will ever see this video i don't even think he's in e-commerce anymore but the only reason why we're even sitting right here is because we did have a level of you know someone reaching out answering help on how to sell more on teespring and that guy's name was ty holtz and you know, kind of took me under his wing and became my mentor. And it it's exactly what you said. Why are people so willing to share that knowledge and share that information? Because everyone can benefit from each other and the networking and communication that you get from these events, it's second to none. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, the, these guys that I rent office space from here, they were they were they they've come to all of our events so far. And they 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 were just explaining to me how each time they come to these events, if they get a sort of like mindset shift and they learn tactics that they're able to apply and those are beneficial as well, but just the way that it's it's changed the idea about the kind of business they wanna build, the kind of goals they wanna have. And it's almost like those intangible things, it sounds wishy-washy, but the, but the yeah, the perspective sort of changing aspect to, to, because your perspective change when your network changes as well, right? When these people that all of a sudden that are doing these huge numbers become friends of yours or become contacts of yours, it just, I think it just has a really profound effect. And that's really why I love doing events. That's why we're like fo focusing on events so heavily in, in 2019 is it's just like, just good vibes. It's just create this, this incredible, uh, incredible experience for people. And, uh, and then we benefit as well. So, so I'm super happy to be doing it. Let's talk about like, what, what are you guys going to be like preview, preview your talk in Las Vegas? I've, you've done it a little bit, but. I think, well, we did it earlier in the uh, in the foyer and we moved everyone out and we had them be our audience. And then we had a wrestling match and now we're on the call now. But no, I think I think we're really going to be talking about that that secondary level of branding and psychology and the, the why we do things and the how we do things, not only with our personal brand is Blue Pack Marketing, partnering with, you know, 10 figure businesses out there, but taking whether it be tidbits from people that we've known, people that we've met through this world whether that be through applications, through how we use these applications to not only save money, but make more money. Uh, I think a lot of it is just, it's we're gonna be talking branding and then with a big nuke at the end. And if if I gave you the whole nuke spiel right now, we'd probably be on to like nine o'clock Eastern, so. Yeah, looking at a lot of the psychology that we really try to press on consumers, you know, I've, I've mentioned this two or three times on the call now, like you have to stop the scroll. And it doesn't matter if you're selling coffee mugs, if you're selling subscription boxes, if you're selling real estate, you have to find a way to connect to that person. And there's many different ways through imaging and copy that you can really snag someone and you know make them literally drop what they're doing to either buy what you're selling or to get caught in the spider web. And guess what? We're gonna make you buy later on. And if you don't, well, we have a philosophy around here that we call buy or die. So you're either going to buy it or you're going to forcefully remove yourself from our kind of spider web. And, you know, Corey mentioned the nuke method. You know, we love to talk about branding. It's something that we are personally very passionate about. You know, we love following other big brands that are doing things right. You know, there's a reason people buy from Nike. There's a reason people talk about Phil Knight. That's his name, right? Well, I was going to go like Fashion Nova Cardi B, but that's cool. Yeah, that's also pretty cool. Um, but, you know, everyone loves the dash, the dazzle. So we also say flash and function. Well, the function of what we're going to talk about is a lot of the branding, but the flash, you know, people want to specifically also see how, what are you doing on Facebook? How are you successful? And we're going to find a way to combine our branding talk and our psychology and KPIs and automation and have that be a segue directly into what we've referenced as, you know, just a nuke method of just a way to absolutely annihilate any sort of sales that you're trying to get. Amazing. Well, I am extremely excited about that. My last question is I just, I just have to know who is your favorite wrestler of all time then? Mm. I'm Shawn Michaels. I go, I go Shawn Michaels. You talk about sweet chin music. The dude was just a, I mean, 
Heartbreak Kid. How do you not love that guy? I mean, he goes in first in the Royal Rumble and comes out last. Like, come on. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan. You know, Heartbreak Kid, the red, white, and black tights. But you know, at WrestleMania '98, you know, I haven't watched wrestling in probably 15, 20 years. But growing up, we loved it. And you know, who had a better brand than damn Stone Cold Steve Austin? Because I'm pretty oh, sure he would stun Shawn Michaels like that. Oh, he did. He did. I think yeah. that actually ended HBK's career too. Yep. <laughs> Okay. Well, we'll spiral on this in Las Vegas a little bit further, uh, and I'm super excited. We've got, you know, you guys are going to be, oh, I'm excited for your presentation. You guys, you're going to bring some some dynamic heat. I think you're actually opening the day on day two, so you're going to nice. be, you got, you're, you're gonna, you got to get everyone pumped up. Super excited about that. And then, obviously, just during all the networking, I think you guys are going to be a lot of fun. I think people are going to be, you know, going to be able to get a lot out of just meeting you guys and, and picking your brain and, uh, and having a few drinks. It's going to be a fantastic time. Absolutely. I, I plan on having a few. Yeah. <laughs> a few. Nice. Dan Lucas says he's not going to sleep for five days, so we'll see how that goes. He'll be fine. He'll be fine. <laughs> All right. Okay, cool, guys. Well, thanks for your time today. And, uh, yeah, share this in your channels. And, everyone, you got to come see us in Las Vegas, January 9th and 10th. Uh, tickets, we still have some available. Uh, they are heating up, and we will sell out over the last uh, these last few weeks here. But I know right now it's the holiday season, and I think people are kind of like, Okay, they're batting down the hatches, but as soon as that January 1st hits, they're going to be like, oh, I got to get out of here. This all this family time is killing me. <laughs> nice. nice. Thank you guys for having us, and we appreciate it, man. Okay, cheers. Thank you guys. Cheers. All right, move forward. Oh. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow with Jordan Menard. I'm super excited. Jordan Menard is the lead media buyer for samovensconsulting.com. I think they are doing the, one of the coolest campaigns in the world right now. And Jordan is just a super elite media buyer. And I think he's got a super badass mustache, just like my friend Van. So tune in tomorrow. We're going to do that at noon uh, tomorrow. We'll be talking with him and uh, we're going to get into some badass Facebook stuff. Uh, have a great rest of your day.